So scientists have to read over a hundred papers a day and to keep up with this literature is almost impossible. For my last narrative review, I also had to read up to 200 papers, I believe. And to keep up with this and to truly organize, remember and reflect on everything you have read is the hardest skill to learn. In this video, I wanna show you my technique for doing this and I have divided it into two sections. First is to read as much about fields you do not know about. And the second part is to keep up with the literature in a field that you are quite familiar with. I truly wish I had this video at the beginning of writing my narrative review, but I hope by giving it to you that it will help you a little bit with writing any type of review you're writing or with reading and keeping up with the literature in your field. So let's get straight into it. So the first part I want to talk about is reading papers in fields you do not know about. And this is because I think that a lot of us want to learn about new topics and we try to read academic papers to do so but find it quite hard and I think I've kind of developed a technique that can help with this and to allow you to understand a new field as much as possible through reading papers. So the first part of this process is paper selection. So you need to ensure that you have papers that are actually good and that's because different from reading that you do at university is that papers are not always set in stone and they're just the latest type of research but they're not necessarily true research or always good research so there are a lot of papers that are just not so good or even papers that were written five years ago that were trusted by the scientific community and that turned out to have a hypothesis that was disproven later so research is more of an iterative updating process than true knowledge set in stone. And because of this fact, you need to be quite careful about the research that you choose to read. Because in research, there are just a lot of facts that were disproven. So the way I do this is I usually ask my professor for the top 10 papers that he recommends in a new field. And if you don't have a professor, you can also look at this online. For example, through Coursera, there are usually a few papers recommended. Or if you're interested in neuroscience, on the Neuromatch website. There are also a lot of papers recommended for specific fields. Another thing you can do if you don't have access to this type of information is to look at a good review that was written, I would say, in the last five years, but maybe even in the last one or two years, if that is possible and it exists out there. So the second bit is the reading strategy. And the reading strategy that I use is quite similar to reading strategy here. That's called a three bosses, except that it's a little bit less expensive extensive, I believe, but also have a look there if you're interested in common reading strategy that a lot of PhD students use. So the way I go about reading a paper is I usually first look at the title, the abstract and the figures. So I read the title carefully, read the abstract and then look at the figures. And that's just to see, is this paper actually in the topic that I want to learn about? Because sometimes a paper has a certain topic or a certain title that you think maybe suits what you want to learn about but when you read the abstract it's actually about something different so this can already help you kind of curate the reading list that you want to read afterwards i do read it sequentially in a field that I do not know. So for the second part of this video, I will talk about fields that I do know about, but for fields that I don't know about, I usually do read the introduction, methods, conclusion, and focus on the figures as well. And this is because usually there are some terms that I am unfamiliar with and that I will need to look up as I'm reading through the paper. So as I'm reading through the paper, I usually highlight certain terms that I don't know so much about, and I would look them up afterwards on. And also something that I personally really like to do is to kind of visualize the paper as well. So I usually have the figures in mind and as I'm reading through it, I keep referring back to the figures to see if I can understand what's actually being said. So after you have read the paper in full, it's time to kind of like dive into the math and the finer details. And I usually use multiple resources for this because this is a field that you're probably unfamiliar with. You want to use different type of resources than just a paper because personally for me, I find it really hard to only read in a topic that I know nothing about and truly understand what's written. So usually I listen to the top talks and you find these by just looking at the first author or the last author and kind of Google their name. And then quite often there are talks of them in conferences, for example, that you can kind of listen to and understand a little bit more about their topic because usually that's introduced in a gentler way during their presentation. Another thing I do is I find related codes. So for example, 
example, a good website is Papers with Code, but also a lot of papers nowadays have at the bottom of their paper a section that is called Code Availability, and there they list where you can find the code of their paper. And I find personally, if I have the time and I re-implement some of the bits that they've done, that I understand it a little bit better. Also, I would try to find relative, uh, relevant blog posts, for example, quite often for a little bit older papers, you can find good blog posts that explain it in a more easy manner. And lastly, I would also try to discuss it with peers. So this is something that I've noticed that I find really nice as a PhD student. So as a PhD student, you usually have access to people in your lab that are interested in the same topic. And I noticed when I really struggled with a paper, I would go to one of my colleagues or a fellow PhD student, and we would kind of sit down and maybe even explain little bits of the paper to each other. And of course, if you cannot find this in real life, it's also possible to find this on the internet. So you look for friends that maybe are interested in the same topic. Yeah, and I think this is really where you go to the part of deeper understanding of the paper. So through this deeper understanding, you really want to focus on explaining the results to yourself without referring back to the paper. So for example, something that I do to test if I have a deep understanding of the paper is I would only have all the figures and try to explain it to myself or to a friend or a fellow PhD student what I'm seeing in the figure and if I can understand the results that are being presented to me. Another thing that is really good to do during this point is to be quite critical of what you're reading. So again, research is an iterative process. So no research paper is perfect. It's always just a little test of a hypothesis that the authors have that they're presenting to you. And you as a critical reader can decide if you agree or don't agree with a certain argument that is being presented. And I think a really good exercise for this part is to think by yourself, what would be the next research question that I think needs to be answered for me to make this paper more convincing. So this could be, for example, that you think that the sample size needs to be bigger. You think that a different type of statistical test should be used, or maybe you feel that the way they interpret their results are not fully sound with what you're actually seeing on the paper. Also something that I would consider during this reading process is to read multiple papers at the same time. So I personally refrain from just reading only one paper fully. I usually have about like five papers, I would say, on the same topic. And I kind of compare how different authors write about the same topic and what kind of experiments they have done about the same topic. And something that is quite interesting is that sometimes authors find the exact same results, but they interpret it in different ways. And that just shows you that as scientists, we also have biases or hypotheses that we preemptively believe and want to prove. And sometimes these go a little bit above the results that we're actually showing. And that is not to say that these scientists are doing anything wrong, but that they are trying to prove their hypothesis to you. And you can choose if you believe this hypothesis or not. So something that's very critical for me during this process is to have a good reference manager. And that's where PaperPal come in and they were so kindly to sponsor this video. So I personally have always used reference managers and there is a list of them out there, but I think PaperPal is very nice. They have a really interesting intuitive interface. And I think among all the reference managers, it's probably the fastest to learn because it's already integrated fully with the Google environment. So I'll show you really quickly how to use it. So one of the things that you can do with PaperPal is that you can search within PaperPal itself, which I find really nice. So within the PaperPal interface, you can use their search bar and you have the ability to search online for books and articles without leaving PaperPal. And you can also search not only for words or just the names of authors, but you can also search for full phrases, which I think is really nice if you're looking for certain phrases within a certain topic to add to your review, for example. The second thing you can do to find literature is to add papers through your library through the PaperPal extension. So the PaperPal extension I will list down below. You can download and then you can click on this P button in your browser to save the reference. You can add the reference to folders and labels and add notes as you save the reference. So for example, I've done this for my latest review, which had a lot of normative modeling papers, and I just clicked and added it to my normative modeling 
library. You can also save papers directly from academic databases, which I find really nice. So for example, if you go to PubMed, Research Revit, Consensus, or Google Scholar, which are all research bases that I use, you can directly add it to PaperPal like that. And lastly, if you work in Google Docs, you can, for example, write a small snippet of your research paper and then automatically already add your references as you're writing. And I find this really nice because then you don't have to interrupt your workflow to think about how you're going to cite the work that you're using. So be mindful of citing correctly and definitely tools like PaperPal or other reference managers can help a lot with that. So if you want to use PaperPal to save you some time and keep all your references well organized, I will list a link down below so you can check it out. So the second part I want to talk about is reading in fields that you know about quite well. And the reason for this is to keep up with the literature, at least in my field. I think there are papers coming out about like 10, 15 papers a day. And I set these kind of like research alarms in Google to keep me updated when an author that I like or a certain search term is coming up in a new paper. And I think if you see the amount of emails that I get with like an alarm that a paper has been published, it's quite a lot. Let's just keep it at that. And to keep up with this type of literature, you really need to be able to read papers a lot faster than you did in step one. So I do think the reading approach for this then needs to be updated. So the way I do it is with this so-called fast reading approach that I've kind of developed based on the three pass method, but also based on my own knowledge. And that is I start with the abstract of course as always and I just read it quickly and see if the paper is interesting and here I'm quite strict so if there's anything that to me seems like a red flag I automatically remove it so for example is the sample size too small do they use a statistical test that I find finicky is there any type of terminology that I don't agree with and this maybe seems quite strict but these are true red flags for me for papers that in my regard then are not kind of like good to read fully so the next thing I do is I look at the figures and I try to understand what the authors have done by just looking at the figures. So usually I actually don't really need to read the introduction and discussion because I already kind of know what the authors want to present and just looking at the figures gives me a more clear view of what their results are without muddling this with the preconceived bias that these authors have. And the second thing that I like to do is I want to compare their results with their methods. So do their methods match with their results. So sometimes what I see is that, for example, in their results, they present something that looks intuitively quite nice, so in their figures, but when I actually go to the methods, it doesn't really match up or it doesn't really align. So afterwards, if I've seen the figures, I've read maybe the results and uh, methods section, then I sometimes do like to go to the discussion quickly to just see if their points of discussion match with the results that I've seen. And to be very honest, sometimes this doesn't match at all. So I've seen papers where the results were very flimsy, they didn't really show true significance and in the discussion there are words being used like trending towards significance, very big red flag by the way. Um, and this is just in general a little bit a gripe I have with the field and I think every field has its own pitfalls and I think that is something that's a pitfall in neuroscience and sometimes also psychology that the discussion or conclusion doesn't match the results actually being presented. So be uh, wary of this. So after I've done this, something that I've done for my narrative review, so a narrative review is not a structured review. If you want to do a structured review, find good YouTube videos on this or find a good article on how to do this because this is a lot more organized. But a narrative review, you kind of present the literature as you have found it and it's a lot less organized with the search terms that you use. But the way I've done my narrative review, I want to show you quickly, is that I used an Excel sheet. So this is the Excel sheet for all of the research papers that I read. And I, in this sheet, noted down elements of the paper that I might want to reference later. And this really helped me to see overarching themes and remember the differences and similarities between papers. I and I actually learned a lot doing this and I'm considering doing this for every paper I'm gonna write in the future because quite often you read over 50 papers and it's really hard to keep a clear note of which results belong to which paper and also which paper you can or should cite when you're looking at different results. Also something that I like to add as another column is this 
question of the follow-up paper that I think these authors need to write. And usually when I can answer this question, it does show that I quite understand what these authors have done and also what I think is missing. So it allows me both to kind of get, get an overview and also to indicate that I've read the article critically. So the last thing that I wanted to end on is some tips for effective reading that I've gathered over the last few years. First of all, some tips for making reading a habit. So I really find it truly important that you have reading as a habit or something that you do daily. Something to do this is to make a dedicated reading time. So possibly a specific time during the day that you will always read one or two papers and maybe even put it in a specific location like a library. Also make it enjoyable. So make your favorite drink, for example, a little coffee as you're reading. And also something that you can consider is to have a reading group. So as I said, you can gather together a couple of your students or a couple of students to make it into a reading group for discussion and accountability. The second thing for effective reading is to also read for creative ideas. So I do think reading papers is very important, but I also think reading outside of papers is very important. And this for me actually taught me to speed read a lot more and to also enjoy reading a lot more. So something that you can do is to read outside of science in books that are maybe adjacent to science. So for example, you can consider pop science books. I will list a few here that I personally really liked reading. And through reading these pop science books, although they're not always accurate, I do think they teach you a way of speaking about science that's not so dry and not so formalized. Also something that you can consider is to write these little mini essays about topics. I'm really considering about making a video about this as well. But I think if you write a little mini essay about something that you're learning or something that you're interesting, interested about, you will remember it a lot better. And that's something that I've been enjoying doing for the last few weeks. And that I also want to start posting on my blog that I will list down below. So these were some tips for reading in 2024 that I've gathered and kind of quantified over the years. I'm always updating the way I read and I always try to learn new skills and I still don't think my reading techniques are perfect. So if you have any tips for me, I would love to hear them. So put them down below. Also, if you're interested in note-taking and reading, I do think this video is maybe a good follow-up video and otherwise see you next week. Bye!